talk a little bit today about freedom of speech. And uh, primarily because I see freedom of speech as the key element of all of our freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution. Because once you take away free speech, all those other things about religion and press and mm -hmm. right to bear arms, they mean nothing. The reason I want to talk about free speech has a little bit to do with how I was raised. Uh, I was raised in one of seven people in a four-room shack, tar paper shack in Tennessee, without electricity, running water, telephone, car, mm -hmm. or fog. Now, that's a pretty bad start, but it actually was a great start. Now that I'm, I'm now 72 years old, so you look back on your life. And what seemed to be hard then is what made me what I am today. One of those things that made me who I am today was my grandmother, who raised me. And she had a reputation in the little town of Flatwoods, Tennessee. She'd tell the truth to the devil if it hair lived. <laughs> so and long after I moved away from Flatwoods, I discovered that there were some in the community who were a little afraid of my grandmother, Lucy Riley. Because she just told you the unvarnished, straight-up truth, blurted it right out, not a lot of social barriers or anything. So I'm her grandson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> One of my good friends in Nashville is named Vijay Kumar. He's a Hindu who came to America. He's been here now for 30 years, I think. And like some immigrants that I have met, Vijay thinks that America is the greatest country in the entire world. He has absolutely, he sees our warts, but he says this is the greatest country in the world. But he said, I've seen a change in America since I've been here. When I first came to America, he said, I was stunned at how frank and candid Americans were about anything. He said, I couldn't believe that people just spoke their minds. Hmm. He said, as a Hindu, this was astounding to me. Because he said, as most of the Orient were trained to deceive in the sense of always having a pleasant face, always having a pleasant smile, but not necessarily telling you what we think you'd like to hear. So that's what I see in America today, is that I agree with my friend VJ, is that we've reached a point where we have the most powerful censorship in the world, self-censorship. And I'm addressing the group to whom this applies the most. Because by and large, I find that those who complain most about political correctness have three attributes. White, Republican. Hmm. Okay? That's only two. It was a third one, but I forget what it was. <laughs> Male? <laughs> the ones who complain most about political correctness are the ones who obey it the most. Hmm. Because there are other people who don't pay any attention to this. That's right. But I'm talking to a group today who by and large self censors for the simple reason we all want to be seen as nice. Okay, We all want to be seen as nice people. And so as a result, we put the bit in our own mouth and do not speak frankly and freely about many issues. I've seen Republicans run for office and know from private conversation that how they felt about issues, but you never knew about it when they were on the stump because they didn't want to offend anybody. It turns out the biggest crime in America now is not murder, but offending somebody. <laughs> now, one of the questions that I'm asked when I go around speaking, and by the way, you're looking at Bill and what he does. I travel around the country. I've written several books on Islam, and I now speak on Islam everywhere. And one of the most common questions I am asked is, <clears throat> are you afraid? Now, there are two questions wrapped up into this, are you afraid? There is, first off, the question of, do you think you're going to get through the day alive? Okay? And the reason for this is very simple. There are those, we know of people in the world news who have been murdered because they simply spoke their mind about Islam. Now, this is not some aberration of Islamic thought. Because all of Islam consists of obeying Allah and following the perfect example of Muhammad. The Quran has 93 verses which tell the readers that every man is to live, and woman is to live their life like Muhammad. Some Christians say that before a Christian does or says something, they should ask the question, what would Jesus do? 
a Muslim doesn't have to answer that question, what would Muhammad do, because they know what Muhammad would do. The reason is very simple. We have his biography, which is 800 pages long, in fine print, and then we have his traditions called the Hadith, and there's nearly 7,000 of those. So we know what Muhammad would do. We know how Muhammad would drink a glass of water because it's spelled out. We know how Muhammad went to the bathroom. We know how he had sex. We know how when he laid on his back, which foot he put atop the other. And all of these things are to be done by every Muslim. So the question is, what did Muhammad do? Well, what did Muhammad do if people spoke and offended him? Well, there was a poet, a lady, who wrote a poem about Muhammad. So Muhammad sent an assassin with a dagger to her in the middle of the night. The babe was in the bed beside her. They moved the baby gently aside and with two hands drove the dagger through her chest and pinned her to the bed. Why? She wrote a poem that Muhammad didn't like. Then we have another case. Another poet who was a Jew and he wrote a poem about Muhammad. Muhammad didn't like that story either. And there is, this is a hadith. Who will kill Ashraf, who has offended Muhammad and Allah? I will, Muhammad, but I will need to use deceit to do so. You may deceive them. And so Ashraf, the Jew, was murdered in a midnight assassination. Why am I telling you these stories? Because there is a seriousness to offending Islam. People have been killed. But, there's another thing that people are talking about when they say, aren't you afraid? And that goes back to the self-censorship. Because if you speak about the facts of Islam, documented facts, you can be called a bigot. You know how I know that? <laughs> the Tennessean, which is the largest newspaper in Tennessee, has upon four occasions featured me in a front page Sunday edition above the fold. As a friend of mine said in PR when she got the fourth one, she says, Bill, I've never seen anybody with such an ability to get such coverage in the media. <laughs> I said, how do you turn it off? <laughs> so as a consequence of that, you have standing in front of you now, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, worth a quarter of a billion dollars. They're a nonprofit with offshore accounts. Okay? They, yep. they say that I am one of the top ten bigots in America. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but people are afraid of this. I mean, see, I'm from out of town. Okay, so I can stir up whatever I want. When I leave, well, he's gone. But if you start talking trash, truth about Islam, your friends at your church can go, she a bigot. And that's what you're afraid of. You don't want to be thought ill of. And so as a result, you shut up in your face. Okay? I'm here to encourage you to speak about such issues. Here's another example of bigotry. I am not who you think I am. Okay, I started, I, I've lived, I've been a hippie, living in a commune with long hair, okay? I took part in civil rights, I was part of anti-nuke, okay? I have impeccable progressive credentials. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also an apostate. So, anyway, I have come a long way through this, but for the ideals that I upheld during civil rights... I am now condemned as a bigot for holding the same principles. Mm -hmm. What made me a hero in the 60s causes me to be condemned today. Huh. My principles haven't changed, but the view has. But I'm encouraging you to stand up and speak, because if you do not stand up and speak, where are we going to be? All right. Now let me deal with one issue here, which is the reason we have the slide projector here, because I want to bring up something about Sharia law. The reason, remember those stories I told you about Muhammad? Mm -hmm. They are incorporated into Sharia law. Sharia law does not allow any criticism of Islam, Muhammad, or Allah. 
The call to prayer was given in a North African city, and a Jew walked by the mosque as a call to prayer was issued and said, it's a lie. It is a lie. Four words. He lost his head because of Sharia law. Also because he was a Jew. That's just a little added extra. So I want to show you here how Sharia law became put into place with such power. <clears throat> and also to show you what Sharia law, law does to a civilization. Now, I'm a scientist, and that means that I like to do what I call fact-based reasoning. That's the way I was trained to think and act. And so that's what I bring to the study of Islam. And I've already demonstrated that to you. When I say that Islam can kill those who speak against it, what did I give you? I gave you two incidences from the Hadith, which are a sacred text. Those examples about Muhammad killing those people, those are sacred examples. 93 verses. Everything that Muhammad did is the perfect life to please Allah. And I want to show you here what one of the consequences is in the use of force and ideology. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see. As a matter of fact, we'll see who can see. This, I'm going, this is uh, taken from a lecture that I want to skip over. Here we go. I'm going to, let me go back one. Part of my science business here, and I'm trying to make it so everybody can see right here. Um, I, wanted, I became curious as to how Islam became such a world power. Now, I already had a clue. Everything about Islam comes in twos, because Islam is dualistic. Okay? I mentioned about murdering the Jews. Well, it turns out that in the beginning, Muhammad was very keen on the Jews. He loved the Jews. As a matter of fact, his first comment was that he is the last in the lineage of the Jewish prophets. So he portrayed himself in that lineage. But when he moved to Medina, at the insistence of those when he lived in Mecca, the Jews in Medina looked at him and said, you're no prophet. Two years later, Medina was Judenrein, cleansed of all Jews. So that's where I, that remark comes from as to why the, the Jew who went by the mosque and said, it is a lie, one of the reasons he was murdered. I put together a database of some 548 battles that can be found in history that were fought against us. Why do I say us? Us are the Kafir. Kafirs are non-Muslims. So these are 548 history lessons that were given to people like you. I created what I call a dynamic battle map, and about every time the clock ticks, it's 20 years of time. So we're going to compress... 1,200 years of battles into two minutes time. And we're going to do it. The white dots are the brand new battles. The green is where Islam is. And the next thing, these turn to red and new white dots appear. So what you're going to see is an evolution which I hope will become clear as we go along. Here we go. This is the destruction of classical civilization. Notice how quickly Islam moves out of its very, from its very invention, for the time it invented itself, and notice how it is spreading. Look here, one of the things we see is that Islam immediately starts attacking all of its neighbors, its neighbors to the east, its neighbors to the west. Notice that it has to have a navy to do this, a very powerful navy, which is projecting power across the Mediterranean. These battles are ceaseless. They never, ever stop. Why? Because once Muhammad turned to jihad, after 13 years of being a religious leader, he started his jihad, and it never ceased. He had a battle on the average of every six weeks for the last nine years of his life. And that is what is happening. They are living history as if Muhammad lived history. Notice in Spain... There were over, in 700 years, there were 400 total battles fought in Spain. Okay? But the East is also uh, being handled. Constantinople has now fall, fallen, and look what is happening. Eastern Europe is now being attacked. These attacks will continue. Let's see, where are we? 14, okay. 
By the way, one of the things that's happening in all of these battles is that slaves are being taken. A million Europeans will be taken into slavery in these series of battles. Islam has an extensive slave doctrine. Muhammad, by the way, owns slaves, black, white, and Arab. It's very interesting. For every slave Muhammad owned, they tell you his race. Now then, see the white dots there on the north coast of Africa? That's the United States. These are the seven frigates. The Barbary Coast Pirates, the Marines, the Leathernecks. So, oddly enough, we are on this map as well. What was that famous thing that Jefferson said? Millions for defense, none for tribute. Okay. Did, we, did, did they lose any of these battles? Oh, yes, they lost some. They didn't win them all. But for, you can tell what happened in the sense of the massive conquest. Now, they were driven out of Spain, and they were driven out of Eastern Europe. But by and large, most of their conquests were never driven back. Iran fell. I mean, Pakistan fell. Uh, all of these countries fell and have never been reclaimed. And by the way, this is just in the 20th century. It's tragic, but most Christians don't know that a million Armenian Christians lost their lives in Turkey for a simple reason. They were not Muslims. They were Catholics. And, of course, we have 2, 000, 2 million Sudanese Christians killed in the 20th century. Now, I'm going to show you the same thing because of the Crusades. And in the Crusades, they're sometimes given by leftist intellectuals who say, well, there was that jihad stuff. Yeah, well, there was a little of that. There's bad stuff in the Old Testament, too. Mm -hmm. right? But the Crusades, and by the way, I have been in churches watching a Christian minister practically cry over the brutality of the Crusades as being the nadir of all history. Let me show you the truth of the Crusades. Number one, these people were not leaving France and Europe and putting on armor and horses to go get rich. All of them lost money and their lives. There were 30,000 churches destroyed under one caliph. That's the supreme ruler of Islam. Christians and Jews under Islamic rule were denies, Real quickly, a dhimmi is basically a slave. You have no civil rights. A dhimmi cannot testify in court against a Muslim. A dhimmi may not carry a sword, but only a dagger. A dhimmi can't ride a horse, but has to ride a donkey or a mule. And has to wear clothing that can be distinguished. Everybody knows how the Nazis made the Jews wear armbands, right? Mm -hmm. He was simply copying Muhammad and Sharia law. Because both Christian and Jew had to be able to be identified as far away as the Pachyderm Club there. All right? Because, you see, if a Jew, I mean, if a Jew approached a Muslim on the street, the Jew had to step off into the street and let the Muslim pass. If you're a Christian and you're sitting somewhere and a Muslim walks in, you hop up and you give him your seat. Oh, and did I mention to you that he can show up at your house and you have to feed him clothing and take care of him for three days? Yeah. This is the plight of the Denny. There was constant brutality. Christians were fleeing. And so the Byzantine emperor in what is now Turkey called for help. And this is what Europe saw at the time of the first crusade. Notice what has happened here. The Middle East, which used to be Christian, is gone to Islam. A third of Turkey, gone to Islam. North Africa, St. Augustine preached and taught from North Africa. North Africa used to be within the European sphere. It was a Christian part of the world. That's gone. Spain is nearly absorbed in all of Islam. Look at the attacks on Sicily. Look at the attacks on Italy. And this is not as bad as it gets, because coming in from the north are the Vikings, and coming in from the steppes of Russia are the Magyars. It is possible at this time in European history to imagine that Europe will cease to exist as a civilization and a culture. This is the state of the First Crusade. This was not a bunch of nobles and other people in Europe out looking for a good time and to take some money. All right? Now then, here we go. Remember the battle map? We're going to run the same battle map on the same time scale and the same geographic location as we did for the Jihad. That's it. <laughs> By the way, ISIS.
assembled all this data. Each frame was put together by a man I used for graphic arts. When he got the data for the Crusades, he called me up and he said, uh, Bill, where's the rest of the data? I said, that's it. Long pause. I've been lied to. Yeah. <laughs> You've been lied to. i got one more curve I want to show you. By the way, the Crusades lasted 300 years. They ended 800 years ago. Jihad is around yet today. Okay? And all of the Crusades were defensive. What do I mean by defensive? Hello, when the Christians were going back to Jerusalem, it was theirs originally. They were right. trying to throw the thieves out. Right. And yet, what are we told in the history books now? Well, they invaded Islam. Okay. Moving along, there's one more curve I want to show you here. Uh, oh, this is interesting. The, there's been 19,000 jihad attacks since 9-11. Did you know that? 19,000 of them. They fall mostly on Israel, Thailand, the Philippines, and India. Read it again. Jews, Buddhists, Christians, and Hindus. Mm. Left out? The Church of the Atheist. <laughs> Islam despises an atheist worse than they hate any other religious life. Okay, what am I looking for here? Ah, <coughs> right, here we go. Oh, let me show you this. This is Muhammad's growth curve. For 13 years, he preached the religion of Islam. Got 150 people to follow him. 150. 10 a year. He was driven out of Mecca. He went to Medina, where he became a politician and a warlord. And when he died, he did not have a single enemy left standing. Every Arab was a Muslim. Translation, the religion didn't work. The politics is what brought Islam its success. Politics is what I object to about Islam. I don't care one way or the other if they get to go with their heaven or they go to their hell. Okay? I don't, I'm not concerned with that. I'm not concerned with your religion. All I'm concerned with any man's religion is what character does it produce and what ethics does it preach. That's what I care about your religion. And oddly enough, all the religions of the world teach the golden rule except Islam. Because all of this murder that's going on is against Muhammad's neighbors. He was not a good neighbor. Well, if he did everything he said, he was a good neighbor. But anyway, notice here we have two Muhammads. <clears throat> two Muhammads. The war, political, and the religious leader. One other thing to point out here is, how does Islam introduce itself into a society? Where are we down here when, it, when time is at zero? We are a religion. We have come to America to practice our religion. You ever heard that? Okay, next curve. This is what happens under the Sharia. You have been told that when Islam invaded, everyone had to, ever heard this phrase, convert or die? That is not the way it happened. It happened like this. Islam invades in the year 1300. This is where Constantinople is taken. This is Turkey, which was called, you know, Turkey's mentioned in the Bible. You know that, don't you? And it's called Asia Minor. The seven churches of Asia. Remember that? What happened to them? This is what happened to them. They got put into the grist mill of the Sharia. Every Christian became a dimmy. And as a result, as time goes on, the Christians convert to Islam. Why? They'll make twice as much money because they don't have to pay the jizya. They can go to court. They won't have stones thrown at them, and their daughters won't be raped. Well, after a few centuries, that seems to be a good deal, doesn't it? I mean, just go down and say there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. Shazam! You're richer. You're more powerful. That is what happened to Christianity. The Sharia ground down Christians. And one of the things it says to the Christian, you may not preach your doctrine, you may not put a steeple on your church, as a matter of fact, you can't even fix the roof on your church until you go ask the imam. Total subjugation. By the way, totaling up all these wars, 60 million Christians, 10 million Buddhists, 
80 million Hindus, and 120 million Africans, all murdered in jihad. So that is the doctrinal background as to why people ask me the question, aren't you afraid? Nobody knows all these details. This is sort of interesting, I find. All of these details, and by the way, do you see all the numbers? I'm a scientist. But for putting these numbers up, <clears throat> I've been called a racist, a bigot, and a hater, and an Islamophobe for totaling up the body count. Yeah. Because you're not supposed to talk about that. That's the reason what you just saw, these charts and graphs, are the reason that I'm one of the top ten bigots in the United States. And that's the reason you don't want to talk. Because even when you're telling numbers, they're going to smear you. And you don't want to be smeared. I presume that many of you are Christians. I want to point out something to you. Jesus was not well liked. <laughs> Jesus was not a nice man. Jesus was hated and persecuted. My question to you is, where are your stripes? Because here's the deal. I come into town and I have two view I find out that people view me in one of two ways. I'm viewed as the missionary who's in Uganda <clears throat> digging wells for the natives. Okay? That's one way. And the other way that I'm viewed is like Clint Eastwood or uh, Dirty Harry or uh, any of those, you know, Marshall <laughs> Dillon. I'm the guy with the gun who's going to come into the town that's been oppressed and I'm going to shoot it out on Main Street and I'm going to leave. Who was the man with the silver bullet? And you're going to, wow, he saved this town. Ah! I don't work that way. You've got to stand up and speak to it. You've got to become a bigot. You have to become hated. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know of another way to do it. Because we cannot win with a lie. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We have to tell the truth, and we will be hated for that truth.